will commence. I'm Carol Davis, as I mentioned previously, I'm co-chair of CEDA, and I wish you a very warm CEDA welcome. We are still let letting people in, um, and this may continue for a few more minutes, but we wanted very much to start um, our webinar. And for more information about CEDA and to read about our work, go to our website, become a member if you're not already, and consider contributing to our many committees, which we are looking to diversify and, and broaden. A huge thank you to you, the audience, for signing up to this webinar. You honor us with your presence. A huge debt of gratitude to Louise Lockland, our administrator, for the frequently invisible work, uh, which is so critical to putting on an event su such as this. Our focus for this afternoon is decolonizing the curriculum, why the concept requires a wider conversation. The housekeeping arrangements are as follows. We have turned your, your mic off um, and the, vi the video also. So we do see some static pictures of you, which is great. Um, but that is not to say this is not the conversation we have advertised it as. Use the chat um, prolifically, keep your questions coming in. You have the possibility of posting in the chat anonymously and privately. If you are more comfortable, we, we welcome that. To reassure you, whilst there are no slides, this is, as it suggests, a conversation with, with you and a discussion. We will be sending you a recording shortly after this event and also the text of the chat because often people use it to post very useful links and we absolutely love that. I apologize if in advance I can't get to all your questions um, but I think this will be the first of um, many events on this subject for, for CEDA. Um, we have four speakers you will see from their biographies, Common Ground, different focus, perspectives and experiences, which is why they are here to share with you. They will have five to seven minutes each to talk and I'll gently remind them a minute from the end. And then we will move to, I think, which is really good stuff, the opportunity to address your questions and take the conversation where you want it to go. Um, so as I said, you use that chat, chat, chat function um, and we are very excited to welcome onto the stage our first speaker, Jason. Come on down. Great. First and foremost, I um, just want to say a huge thank you to um, Carol and to Louise for the fantastic work they've done in putting this on. Um, we'd like to say welcome to the, by what it seemed global sender community. Um, it's not lost on me that people are busy and are managing lots of different things at this kind of turbulent uh, moment. So thank you so much for being here. It's much, much appreciated. Um, I'm in a very fortunate position that I get to share this platform with some exceptional colleagues. So hopefully in having the privilege of kind of opening part of this discussion, I guess one of the things that I want to kind of talk about, you know, very, very briefly for the next five minutes is the situation we find ourselves in. So I guess to start off with, um, the situation we find ourselves in is that racism as an instrument is really intelligent. It's really smart, it's pervasive, and it has managed to outsmart us all for the best part of, and pit us against one another for 500 years. Um, it's an intelligent instrument that is able to reinvent itself. And I guess one of the things that I'm always mindful of is that while racism reinvents itself, we- in terms of our kind of engagement with tackling and engaging in anti-racist approaches, because of how quick racism is able to manifest and to kind of infiltrate all different forms of institutions, we are very often not able to keep up with this. Um, but what it does, what it has brought, this enforced period of reflection because of lockdown, yeah. is a reconceptualization and a reinvention of how we look to address and tackle and engage in anti-racist endeavor. And I suppose one of the things that I would first 
like to discuss in the first instance, I guess, is to can you know the reconceptualization of white allyship. I think that becomes really, really important in this. I think that um, you know, as I've mentioned previously, all too often, white allyship has been quite seasonal in its approach. It's intermittent, and what we need is a consistency of anti-racism and a brand of anti-racism within the guise of whiteness and white allyship or out of the guise of whiteness within into white allyship that looks to disrupt patterns as often and as frequently as possible while leveraging power and privilege because it's that same power and privilege that works at the behest or the disadvantage of people of color. I think in terms of thinking about how we kind of progress and stay in touch with, I guess, uh, racism as an instrument, one of the things that I think is really important is the collective. And I think that there is a broad church with many different forms of resistance, but one of the forms of resistance um, or anti-racist endeavor that I would like us to, to revisit almost and engage with is Nelson Mandela's conception of forgiveness. Um, the reason why I say that is because one, I'm, I'm part South African, so that's one thing. Um, two, Nelson Mandela is probably my hero. There's no problem about it, he is my hero. And secondly, I think that racism is able to reinvent itself, but our approaches haven't necessarily kept reinvented. We haven't reinvented the types of approaches we, we use to address or dismantle racism. So I think while I would never trivialize the hurt, the pain, the victimization and the violence of racism, and particularly how people have experienced, people of color have experienced this over hundreds of years, many decades, particularly within the UK context, I do think that we need to find a common ground and that common ground needs to reside in the fact that I guess, white people need to acknowledge that there's a power and privilege that they have to varying degrees. They also need to acknowledge that they may have been unconsciously or consciously complicit in acts of racism. I think there then needs to be a period of reconciliation, forgiveness, where we find that common ground and where we give people the opportunity to make mistakes, to learn, give them that margin of error. And I think that's important because what's interesting is with children, we give children that huge margin of error in the classroom in a pedagogical sense. You know, when I was a teacher, that's what you do. You give children that margin of error to get things wrong. But for whatever reason, we close that margin of error when we become older. And I think it's really, really important that in this period of discovery, which is what it is, you know, people are discovering, many people are discovering for the first time what white privilege is, how that manifests and how it works at a disadvantage of people of color. I think there needs to be a meeting in the middle where we all collectively think about what we can do to one, use this new reconceptualization of white allyship and two, to mobilize it, to create a collective force to really dismantle racism. Now, my, my personal opinion, and I'm, an, and I'm an idealist and I always have been and I always will be, um, I'm a hippie as well. So my, my way of thinking is always that there is a way, there's always a way, nothing is insurmountable. Staying ahead of racism is very difficult purely because it's so insidious and so intelligent, it manages to find ways to infiltrate society in different ways. But what you wanna do is keep racism in eye shot. You wanna be within touching distance of it. Right now, there's a feeling that we're almost out of touching distance. And when it, the further along it gets, the easier it is for it to manifest and interweave within our institutions and within all of our egalitarian values and belief systems. So I think it's really important that we work collectively together and we utilize the power of the collective to really think about how we challenge racism, how we dismantle it, and more importantly, stay abreast of it, stay within touching distance of it. Because I do think there'll be a time where we can grab racism on the shoulder and we'll be able to pull it down. I literally do believe that. And I do genuinely believe that will happen in my lifetime. Now, that might be wildly optimistic and wildly idealistic, but I have to think like that because I have two children one that's nearly 14 and one that's five. And I have a very, I personally ha would, would love to conceptualize the world they live in. So, you know, it's that whole thing of the pioneers never reap the benefit to their soil. So all the efforts that everybody's putting in now, you know, they may not realize that, but it's incumbent upon us as custodians of the academy to really do everything we can to dismantle these racist structures, not only within the academy, but in society, generally speaking. And the reason why I make that kind of segue into society 
is because education is widely seen as a microcosm of society. So it's often seen as a reflection of society. And what we need to think about in this collective is the purpose of education is to prepare people to take their place within society. Do we have an education system, an education structure globally that is preparing people to take their place within a multicultural, multi-ethnic, diverse community or society? I would say right now it's happening in pockets, but it's not happening in the wide cascading way that we need it to be. And for me, that becomes a really central issue. So I think I'll leave us with that. I think for me, there's always power in the collective, but there's a process of forgiveness that needs to ensue with that. And it happens with all of us beginning to think about how we can dismantle racism as a collective rather than in an individualistic capacity. And as I said, there's a broad church with many different forms of resistance, but I do think that forgiveness and collectivity is one that we maybe need to embrace a little bit more in the face of, you know, a, an instrument, a divisive instrument that's able to reinvent itself all the time. So thank you so much for your time. I'm really grateful. And I'm the warm up act to some fantastic speakers. So it's only going to get better from here. So thank you so much. I'm really grateful. Jason, thank you. Thank you um, so, so much. Before I introduce our next speaker, I um, just wanted to say a big thank you to those of you who are tweeting. And we're, we're, uh, we don't have a specific um, CEDAR hashtag, but if you can include CEDAR in any of your in any of your tweets, that would be great. We really appreciate that. And for your own enjoyment, if you want to switch to speak of you, do so. With um, further ado, I'm going to introduce our second speaker. Hilary, would you please take your seat on the stage? <laughs> my virtual stage. Um, I've got a corner of my room actually, which is my actual virtual stage. So this isn't what my normal background in life looks like. It's all a facade to make it look like home is some sort of parallel for a work environment. And, and I think, you know, us being here today and us being able to connect in the ways we are today is a real testament, not only to our commitment to carry on going, but, you know, especially speaking on this topic, it's a testament to our commitment to really engage um, no matter the context we're, we're, we're working with. And, and I think, you know, my plants, which are slowly dying, um, are, are a show of, of really thinking about how we can adapt there. So I think I have to always start just as Jason did. And um, we're saying thank you. Thank you to Carol and Louise um, for inviting me here. And, you know, I, I think it's particularly enjoyable when I come to these spaces because um, I, I come sort of in with, with two hats on my head almost. I come... Um, as a person with a, a too long a title than I need um, to do my work. Um, so I'm the Vice President of Higher Education at NUS. But I also come because I have a passion for, for decolonization and I have a passion for students being at the center of that. And so I get to combine those two in a really intimate way in these spaces. And so I'm really, really glad to be here. So thank you. Um, and so I, I think it's I think it's always lovely when I, I get to follow Jason because I think he's really, really good at setting the scene and, and really getting us into a place of, of understanding where our thinking should be starting at and where our action should be starting at in any of this work. Um, and whenever I think of this work, by virtue of me being a student representative, um, by virtue of me just finishing being a student almost over a year ago, um, I, I always come here thinking, and, and my starting point always has some element of thinking about students. Um, and, and especially in the space of decolonization, thinking about students and, and who students are in our society and what they're doing in this field of work is particularly impactful um, for me whenever we're speaking about this. And so I, I bring students as, as my, as my, you know, my front facing element, which I'm going to, you know, continue to allow this, this framing of decolonization and understanding its holistic nature. Um, I bring students as, as that, that, that really physical way of embodying what it means to decolonize. Um, and so I think, I think it's important for me to say that um, for us to really think about decolonization work holistically, we must not think about it as purely academic work or something that just happens in the space of education. But instead, we must think of decolonization work as work that is inherently to do with humanity. We don't think of humans as parts, instead whole beings with different interests, personalities, lines of work, and elements that bring them together as whole. 
therefore, it is important that we think of decolonization the same way. Although it can be broken up into many parts that feel more manageable, it must be viewed as a whole piece of work that is inherently intertwined and so must be worked on with a mindset of doing it in a whole scale way. Therefore, if you've come here to think about decolonization just in relation to the curriculum, I'm here to tell you that it goes much wider than that. Decolonization in its nature goes to the very root of which our institutions, our system, the Western world was built, namely on the colonial legacy and looks to uproot and most importantly, rebuild a world that enables all to be free to learn, engage, explore, be included and be seen. That requires all of us here, no matter what our job role, the color of our skin or our identity, to have a stake in this decolonization work and understand it's relevant in all our areas of working. And so in my, in my cheerleader type way of, of always championing students, um, I have to talk about this in the context of how students are showing this. In tackling the colonized nature of the curricula, they are also looking at how this pairs up with pedagogy. Um, so my history of this is when I was at Bristol, so I studied at University of Bristol um, only, what, a few years ago, a year and a half ago. Um, one of the things that really engaged me with this work in the starting point of my journey was a campaign that was ongoing called Why Is My Curriculum White? And that was a space that students, students led that space, created that space for them to be able to engage with academics and, and, and staff members in the university and really, really speak about why is their curriculum right, white? Really, really think about why it is that their curriculum felt so boxed into a viewpoint and, a, and an outlook that didn't include all of the perspectives they knew to be true and, and living for them. Um, and so I think it's really interesting because as that developed, students also went wider to think about not just the content of their curriculum, but the pedagogy or the teaching that goes hand in hand with the delivery of that curricula and how that impacts the way that they can engage and learn and really explore education as an enriching experience um, rather than an experience where you learn, you memorize, you regurgitate and you keep on going without actually having the space to question and wrestle with knowledge in the ways that are just so essential if we really want to engage with learning. So I wanted to use an example of a very, very, very good friend of mine um, back at Bristol who's still there as a medic um, called Eva. And she's the president of um, a society called BME Medics. Um, and what she's done, which is particularly interesting and, and particularly, you know, particularly heavy in this space, is that in medicine, which creates a, a really great way of explaining it, you have the theory side where you're, you're pretty much trying to understand and learn all of the, the things that are in your textbooks and you've got the practical side. And she, alongside other, other really, really impactful um, people of color on her course have come together and formed an anti-racist group within their school, within their faculty, to really look at how the theory, the content is inherently, you know, colonized. Um, and how the how the practice, how the pedagogy, how they're being taught hand in hand is colonized in that aspect. And through what they've done, not only have they challenged and, and, and pushed for that content to be expanded, it's also meant that the pedagogy, the way they are taught is expanded inherently because that content allows for a greater diversity. And, and I use diversity there because that's the right way of calling, speaking about it, a greater diversity in the decolonized sort of content and curriculum that they're now exploring in the medical school. Um, of course, I, I'd be happy to signpost you to where you can get updates on that work, but it's, it's being shown in a lot of places at the moment. So really, really great stuff. Excuse me, in Hilary, the, I'm just queuing you into one minute remaining. No worries, I'll be done in, sec, in a sec. And another example about how this work looks like holistically, I also hear a lot about what it means to lead in this work. And I think it's always really funny when we think about leadership in this work, because I think it's important that when we think about decolonization, it's a practice, it's a mindset, as well as a concept. And so we have to really think about the collective, just as Jason said, in thinking about how we really engage with decolonization work in a way that looks at its transformative element. And so to keep him within my time, and I'm sure I can go on um, as we get into a conversation, 
I want to end with this. I, I want to end with the fact that decolonization is, is a concept that requires for you to go on a journey with yourself, your institution, the sector, and the system of education. And so if you are really going to engage with this work, I really want you to remember this quote that I'm going to say to you now um, and really think about it in its most tangible sense. It's by Lila Watson, um, who said this, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So that's what I'll end with. Decolonization is more than just EDI or inclusion work. It's about our interlinked freedom and our ability to thrive. Thank you. Hopefully that was in time. <laughs> thank, thank you, Hilary. And I don't, you know, don't worry about the time because we can pick the, um, you know, these points up again in, in the discussion. And there's lots of um, comments and questions coming through um, on the chat re relating to both you and Jason's pre presentations. So all, all good. So thank, thank you so much. And I should now like to invite up onto the stage Stryker, who um, had to get up so very early to be with us. Um, Stryker, what time is it in Saskatchewan now? Uh, it's about almost 7.30. Yeah, so, so it's early. And I'm also recognizing other colleagues who are here with us today from um, also from time, time zones, um, not, not our own. So, um, but really pleased to have you here, Stryker. And I know that everyone is very keen to hear what you have to say. So over to you, the floor is yours. Uh, Marcy, uh, uh, Stryker Kelvez Dishna Kashun, Amma Chif Nia. Um, I also like to start with my acknowledgements, but in, in my uh -huh. role, I start with a land acknowledgement. And so I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. I'm a Métis man from this area. I'm from the, my family is from the Red River part of the Central Plains of Canada. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with uh, Jason Hillary and, and Marilyn that Carol has offered to me. It's great to be spending time with people who understand and who have invested so much to such an important cause. Um, in Canada, Indigenous people have been struggling with this issue of colonization since the first time Western people showed up. Um, and it's been a journey that we didn't necessarily uh, select, uh, but one that's been put upon us. And my role here at the University of Saskatchewan is to really help people to find a way into reconciliation. And for that, it needs to be more than just a uh, personal, it needs to be more than a professional, it needs to be very personal, right? You think about the lives that we've all lived, we've all been enculturated into a set of worldviews with values and beliefs that are structured to help us work together with the people around us. And so the importance of it is, is sacrosanct, it's just, it's all encompassing. And when, when you come from the dominant society, it seems like there's nothing, nothing wrong with it. Everything seems to work for you. But as somebody who comes from a vulnerable population where you start to see that even in the smallest things that you do in your lives, that things are structured to make it more difficult. The flow is always upriver. There's always a struggle to get to where you're going. Um, and in order to, for us to sort of find our place in society, we need to help, help find or build our way into it because it's not naturally there for us. And the only way that happens, in, to be honest and fair, is through allyship. And, and for us, allyship is such a natural thing. And we are fortunate in Canada that in the last 10 years, there's been a very, really significant shift in the Canadian societal norms and expectations and this wonderful acceptance of Indigenous people as this rich and valuable, thriving community of people that live right in the center of everything, but have never ever been tapped on the shoulder to participate. And we're now being able to participate but our participation still comes with us having to swim upstream, um, with us having to fight the currents, and and that's a big that's a big problem because it's an it's a it takes us we try to achieve the same things as other people in the institution and in our lives, but the effort to do, do it is twice as much, and it doesn't seem fair. And and a lot of the allies that I have around me understand and respect that. 
But one of the things we have to naturally understand is that if, an, if you want to help make a shift towards reconciliation, if you want to help your society shift towards a future that all of our children can live in and thrive in, and in Indigenous culture, our focus is always the children, right? It's not about self. We're a very collectivistic group. And so our children are really where we want to spend our time. And I know that for my allied colleagues, that their children are also the value, most valuable thing. So it's the starting point for a common understanding where we want to go when we think about reconciliation. But there's three things that I really talk about when I talk about this personal journey towards supporting reconciliation when I'm talking with allies. And the three things that I like to bring up is, is that you, you need to bring your heart and soul. It has to be a personal journey first. It's hard to put the effort in to fight all of the tensions and all the structural barriers from a professional capacity. You have to be engaged 100%. So that personal journey is really important. The second thing, well, actually, that's the precursor to the three things. So I apologize, I get ahead of myself here. Um, but the, the three things that are really important is, is that we need visible allies. We need people who are noticeable. When I go into a room and I have to describe and start to talk about the journey that I've been on and the, the journey my people have gone on, I need to know who's in the room. And oftentimes I can't tell in a, in a room full of dominant uh, culture okay. people who's on my side and who's not on my side. And that's not a bad thing, it's just a fact of life. So what I need is people who are visible allies. The second thing I need from my allies is I need them to stand up and stay standing. Um, one of the things I don't have a choice about is when I get to be a, 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 ch a champion for my people. I always have to be a champion because my children need it. It's a, it, it, I can't give up for even one minute. But allyship is one of those things where you can pick a moment where you feel safe and secure and you can stand up and do the right thing. And at other times not stand up. But as an Indigenous person who really needs to know who my allies are, I need people who are there all the time and in every situation. And so I need people who are gonna stand up and stay standing. And the third thing I really ask for my allies is, is that your personal safety is important as much as it is mine, right? I need allies that are going to last a lifetime. This is a journey that we're all going to be on until the end of days for us and that we're going to pass on to our children and we have to model that commitment at that high level. And so I really need allies to organize with themselves because it, it, I love the fact that most allies like to come and speak with Indigenous people and they like to get their, their uh, get some guidance and support. They want to show their collaborative nature. But also there's 33 million people in Canada and 1.7 million Indigenous people. We cannot carry the load for that entire society. We need people who are gonna carry that themselves. And in that sense, I need, I need allies to step up and work together. But it's, it's, a, it's a social nature, it's, a, it's an obvious nature because in joining together, allies get to think about their own worldviews and values, and then they get to rewrite the narrative of that. We're not asking anybody to be different. We're just asking you and the values that you have and the beliefs that you have, how can they shape and support an inclusive and supportive society? Right? Where can we find the values where we want to respect and we appreciate those who come with differences, who have different ideas, who may think of things in different ways. And so with those three things, I, I hope allies have this excellent opportunity to not just show up for this challenge that we have called reconciliation, but to thrive in it, to live in it, and to gift their children this, this, the beauty of loving the world in all of its complexity. So if I go any further, I'm just going to keep rambling. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Oh, we would never accuse you of rambling, Sraka. Thank, thank you so, so very much. Um, and there's lots coming through on the chat, lots of questions and comments. So do um, keep abreast of it. But as I said, we um, will we'll send you a summary of, of that. Well, not a summary, it will be the complete. Um, and again, I, th I think it's now happened for everyone to mute their mics, please, um, unless you're talking. Thank you very much. So, to, as I said, to bring us home, um, Marilyn, um, please, please join us. Can't come to the stage. I'm really Absolutely. looking forward to what you have to say, as I know everyone else is. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so very much, um, Jason, Hillary and Stryker. I kind of feel like, wow, how do you follow that? There's so much inspiration amongst the, the words that have been shared with us so far. So the, 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 the way that I want to approach this, knowing who, who I was going to be working with and what kinds of things people might be saying, is to 
bring this to the practical and meaningful and the kind of how do we actually embed some of this work into the practice. So I just want to share, I'll start by sharing with you a simple but pivotal moment that happened at my university, Roehampton, in the spring of 2018. And one of our students said, as a black woman living in London, a place that's so diverse, I chose to come to a London university because I thought that the curriculum would reflect the population and the student cohort. And she said, I'm so disappointed, it just doesn't. And that simple, simple statement that she made kick-started a university-wide conversation, one that had been bubbling along for a long time. But it resonated and it happened at exactly the same time we were in the middle of an Office for Students funded project around reimagining attainment for all. And it helped us and propelled us into action. So our students and a student body came together and they challenged and they said our curriculum was Eurocentric and it gave prominence to a small number of privileged groups. And she asked, why were people like her and people in her cohort, those were people of African and Caribbean heritage, people of South Asian heritage, people of East Asian heritage, Southeast Asian heritage, and all the people who are ethnically and culturally diverse, and all those people who were experiencing racism. So what we were calling the neglected and the omitted ones. Why, how could we turn our curriculum around to make sure that they featured in a positive way, that the university experience was positive for all of them, one where they belonged and one where they were central to and part of. So we sat with them and we spent a lot of time with our student and staff group. And the first thing that we wanted to say was we weren't asking academics to disregard the canon but we were asking them to disrupt the conventional wisdom. We were calling for greater representation of non-European thinkers, as well as a better historical awareness of the context in which scholarly knowledge had been produced, i.e. colonialism. And this became part of an activity, and we talk about a journey, a journey that we'd started. And we started that journey, as I said, with a project, and our project was around interventions about belonging, about curriculum, about teaching and learning, i.e. the pedagogy of what we do. So not just what we do, how we do what we do, about assessments and the variety of assessment approaches that we use, about the academic and pastoral support. And that was underpinned by uh, having to stop and look at issues like anti-racism, to look at allyship, to focus on all of these things together, so how it impacts on student outcomes and about the disparities that we know exist. So alongside this work, we also were working on producing and submitting for the Race Equality Charter. So we wanted to know how we could use that to help us to inform the culture of the university. Because what all of this is about in terms of decolonization is cultural change. It's about us changing the organization to think differently, charging the organization to act differently, to be different. Our students also charged us to create what they called cultural mutual understandings, because what they were saying was, we were learning about a culture and we come to the university and the dominant culture is the one that we're bending to, but it was ignoring our culture, ignoring the culture of all the diverse groups that make up the student cohort. So we needed a, a new mutual understanding of culture and that meant that we would have to change the curriculum. We needed to then look at the perspectives and look at the lens in which we viewed our work and we needed to broaden and take account of the student body and the global world in which we're part of. So at Roehampton, 53% of our undergraduate students are people who are ethnical, ethnic and culturally diverse. And 53% of our students are in the category where who could often did experience racism. Our classrooms are global villages. 
our classrooms are made up of all of these different people. And there's a wealth of experience in those classrooms, a wealth of prior learning and a, that can be brought onto the ideas and the concepts that were being studied. So it was about ensuring it or trying to create a situation whereby every student would feel that they belong and that the institution is a place where their ideas and they could flourish. So in terms of what we did, if we looked at top down, actually saying, well, these are some things that you're going to have to do. So we had to get senior leadership buy-in, but also it's about bottom up. We needed to take people with us. And we've been talking here about allies and the importance of collective and doing this together. It is about hearts and minds. It requires work. It's not something you're just going to do. You have to work at it. And it's about mutual respect. So, the example we use is we say, well, when a student turns up to take a module, they don't know very much about that module in advance, but they do the work and they kind of learn something new. And at the end of it, they're, you know, they've grown because of it. But what we're saying now is that tutors, those people who used to come with the answers, now they're going to be challenged as well to step up. They're going to have to step out of a comfort zone and to look at their situations, their ideas, their concepts in new ways. And for that, we weren't going to compromise on. So there's learning on both sides, academics and students learning in partnership. The learning outcomes for our students don't change. The decolonized curriculum still provides students with an academically challenging and intellectually stimulating opportunity to acquire knowledge, to promote critical and creative and analytical thinking. But decolonization goes further because it helps them to do it in a way which is more enriching, which is more empowering, and it creates an educational environment which respects and values the learners, it respects and values their prior learning and their current lived experiences. So through the process of decolonization, we're asking students to help to shape the curriculum, to empower them to contribute, to make a difference. And in doing so, they're developing their political efficacy and the agency over their own experiences. So, how we made this happen, we're talking about joint responsibility, staff and students working together as partners, and very much like Stryker said, not for them to take the responsibility for this. It's not their problem, but they're part of the solution, but don't look to them to come up with the solution and to carry the burden of, of, of solving things. It's about cultural change. It's about a willingness, and as I said, a desire. It's about strategy and leadership and governance. It's about deliberate intentions to do things. So this is going to involve training, and we've had to put on training in developing curriculum, in varying assessments, in challenging biases, in learning how to work effectively with allies, and to get an understanding in place that doing nothing is not an option. That what we need to do is have in place anti-racist strategies and approaches, and concrete examples that we could use and support staff with so that when they didn't don't know what to do that actually it's not saying what you're doing is wrong now go away and fix it it's like okay this is where we are how do we move forward together so what we've done for example in one department we've been done things like we've produced a moodle site called decolonizing the curriculum and in that moodle site it's producing materials that the whole department, staff and students can use across all programs. So there's a creation of paired reviewed materials where students are finding materials and saying, I'm sharing this with you. We've looked at it, we think this is good. They're collecting ideas and catching the way that we do in schools with pupils, you catch them being good and then try to get them to repeat it. They're catching their lecturers being good and telling them what good practice looks like and say, when you did this, it was really good and that helped us to learn. Can you do more of that please? And putting good practice, what works into the Moodle site. And they're using this to help them to rethink the work that they're doing across their modules in terms of looking at the assumptions about the world, asking those critical questions about the location of the writer, who wrote this? Why would they write it? What other perspectives could they take on board? 
and to think about the implications so much like Hillary said about what does the pedagogy mean in terms of achievement you know when you're in a social sciences department and you're studying criminology and every reference to somebody black happens to be the perpetrator and everybody white is the victim then what are you saying in the examples that you're using when you're a business studies student and every single um, example of a CEO happens to be white and every example they give of an Asian, South Asian, happens to be the corner shop, what are you saying? Is that the aspiration? Is What's the hidden messages that you're sending out? So we what is... Your... Um, sorry, sorry yeah. to interrupt because I love listening to you. Um, a minute, minute remaining. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start to wrap up now then, just to say that what we've been doing is working with opportunities to work with students and capture and amplify the student voice. We're looking at creating opportunities to empower students and get students to participate in meaningful ways that shape the curriculum that they study. We're provoking reflection and discussion amongst our staff so that they're having to talk about and share this information, which is creating a, a place where departments can put initiatives and share reflections. So just to sum up then, this decolonization that we're talking about, it takes many forms. And as has already been said by previous speakers, it's about taking an honest and self-reflective position. We've got to decolonize ourselves. And that means that shifting our approach rethinking what we do, how we do it, what the implications of what we do might be. And that's not something that's gonna happen overnight. So we always talk in education about a journey. It's part of that journey. Journey for us as an individual, journey for us as the program team that we work with, journey for us as the department that program is in, journey for us as an institution, journey for us as the sector and the impact it's gonna have on society. So I'll stop there. Thank you. That was a great um, finish. And also your focus on what it means for practice, um, Marilyn, is so valuable to um, us at CEDA, you know, a community of educational developers who care very much about the student experience and teaching and learning. So, so thank you. Um, the chat, as one would expect, is um, vibrant and alive with many comments and links and um, su suggestions. Um, what I am going to do is invite our panel of four to um, come together. And I'm going to um, start off by going to some questions which have been asked by people here today. I won't get through all of them. And I also will return to each individual speaker at the end for, for final words and what questions they might like to answer and, and speak to. But the, the first question is for Jason and Hillary. Um, how can people work together in addressing racism when there seems to be many people who are denial that racism exists or even are dismissive of racist actions and thank you very much Joshua for your question so Jason or Hillary I don't know which of you would like to go I've, first. I've had the privilege going first already so Hillary off to you my friend I was going to suggest to you this is just like <laughs> politeness um I I think that's a really really interesting question um, and and I've, I've really had to sort of battle with this question a little bit because I think sometimes when you've come to a space where you really understand and are passionate about something so much you want people to understand you know the passion you have and the willingness you have to tackle um, racism I mean you know for, for me as a black woman you know racism and tackling racism is 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 something that I've, I've never not done you know my very existence is tackling racism because for me to be in the spaces that I am is is, is an act of resistance um towards what racism tries to do I mean I, I think in terms of you know how do you continue this work when there are still people that are denying it where there are still people that refuse to acknowledge its impact the reality is is that Look, I, I can only ever explain that as a journey. Um, and you are on this journey. You are on this journey of tackling racism. You are on this journey of, of continuing to find ways to, to not only tackle interpersonal racism, but structural racism. And you don't, like, it's not for you to stop because somebody wants to stand in your way. Sometimes it takes for you to walk around that person and keep on going because they are, like, 
that one person or, or those those small groups of people that still want to stand in those practically false sort of ideologies that racism doesn't exist or 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 that it's not an important or significant thing just don't really matter because you already know what you want to do and and I don't think that you know all of these barriers that are going to come up because it's such it's such an act of resistance in a world that you know thrives off of what racism produces um it, it's, it's not worth your energy to sort of think about that when you know your ultimate purpose and what you want to do is tackle racism um so what I would say is just carry on on that journey and keep going and if people aren't willing to go on that journey with you that's okay you know that you're doing the right thing and just keep on going um Jason do you want to add in um your thoughts you probably have something more on Richard to say no, with that. no not at all I was just gonna echo what you said what you so eloquently said I mean for me, I, I think one thing I've learned to accept as I've got older is that people are entitled to their opinions. I think when I was younger, my disposition was, this is the right way to think and you must think this way. But actually, if, if there are people who believe that particular discourse, that, that's, that's also fine. Um, I do think there's a large majority of people that reside in a more inclusive and racially equitable space and there are people that want to disrupt the patterns of racism that continuously subjugate and oppress and disadvantage people of color. So I always think it's better to build your house with those people and to continue building on that kind of fertile soil rather than give gas and air to people who would rather um, engage in some sort of nostalgic inequality um, that pervades you know, centuries. Um, I, I think it's a waste of energy doing that. I think there's a bigger collective they are more engaged with having intersectional equality and in particular racial equality, in my, in my humble opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Hilary and Jason. We have a question for Michael, which I'm going to invite Stryker to, to answer. Um, if you would, if you would like, and in, well, the, in fact, the question is for all the speakers, but I'm going to invite Stryker and then Marilyn to, to answer it. How do we address the overwhelming whiteness of the academy and the lack of diversity amongst staff across departments? Oh, this is where I would have liked the wisdom of Marilyn to go first. Oh, well, uh, I mean, would you, would you, oh, okay. no, I, I think you're doing okay. yourself now. Yeah. Just acknowledging that my better is coming next. Um, so this is one of the things I don't, I, I tried, I know that um, racism and the cultural dominance of a perspective is really an important part of academic institutions like ours. Um, it's a thousand years of history and it's built right into everything and every, uh, like into the DNA of the institution. What I really like to do rather than trying to deconstruct or cause harm to those that I'm seeking to get allyship from it is to help them rewrite the narratives, rewrite the narratives about their values and their worldviews. Because in order to go against the, 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 the momentum of what we have happening, right, which is cultural domination, what we need to do is we need to build off strengths and societies are strong, right? We're all enculturated into a society one way or another. And for us to decon deconstruct one is to actually take the foundation which we stand on, which means that people that you're working with and end up falling to the ground because they have no stability in their position to support you. So rather than rewrite, r rather than deconstruct, what I like to do is rewrite the narrative narratives, right? So the values that they find strongest, how do those values apply to allyship and anti-racism and to decolonization and then building that up. And then people come into the moment rather than feeling like they're scared or nervous, like with white fragility is the term we use often here, right? Rather than coming in with that fragility, they come in with that power of who they are, right? And lucky to work in an institution that has incredibly strong and intelligent and passionate people who find what they do to be so important that they've invested their entire lives, right? And when you bring that much conviction around what they think is strong and everything, you bring that to the cause and they build that towards reconciliation, it just makes so much momentum. And rather than promoting what we wanna do, we attract people because once people start to see how well they can thrive in a world that supports reconciliation, other people start to recognize the value of that and it brings them to ask curious questions, which then leads to it. So for me, it's more about focusing on strengths and then building those strengths in support of a movement that really benefits the individual in the moment, but then also we attribute that then down to the children and the seven generations that will come. Marilyn? 
Yeah, again, I feel like it's great because I, I feel privileged. I can build on, on what's been said already. Um, very much in, 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 in the practical and, you know, the, the everydayness of it. Um, one of the things I'm very passionate about is making sure that as organisations, we are organisations where everybody belongs and some people feel that they have a right and an entitlement to be there. And I think, first of all, us are, are in, in order to build, a, you know, we often talk about there's no pipeline. It's one of the reasons why they say you can't find you know, black staff, Asian staff, etc. Sometimes they talk about the pipeline being blocked or the pipeline being, you know, kind of broken. But ultimately, we need to build that pipeline. We need to be growing our own. We have students who are in the academy and we want them to feel that it's somewhere where they don't just pass through in a transient way, but actually there's longevity in the academy for them. So there's opportunity and they feel that it's, it's OK to be an academic, that actually people like them are academics and can be academics. So we've got to create that kind of culture that allows them to feel that. And that's about aspirations. So sometimes just the way in which we act and interact with our students, where we let them know that actually, of course, you can do this and give them opportunities to taste things and to try things and to learn things. So that presenting skills and, you know, putting on student conferences and getting doing joint research with students so they come to conferences with you, encouraging them to move on to master's programs, having scholarships and support to help them move into doctoral programs, giving opportunities to do postdoctoral work. We've got to kind of grow our own, but we've also got to put in place things around um, whether it be mentoring, whether it be call it coaching, but also just that notion of, of some, you know, it doesn't matter who's doing it. So, you know, you don't have to, as a, as a black person, have a black mentor. You can be sponsored and supported by people who are good, people who believe in you, people who look out for you and pull a hand out and want to help you. And then we need more people who are prepared to give of themselves and share of what they've got because often people have got something and they pull the ladder up or they shut it down and try and keep it for themselves. And if we're going to bring the next generation on, you actually have to put a hand out and help people up and have people and know people who you can pass them on to who are also going to help and support. So, you know, there's the obvious things around where we recruit and who we recruit with and where we advertise and all of those things. When we're looking for senior players, you know, what do we write in the brief that will include or maybe exclude people? So I think that there's some practical things around the recruitment and retention kind of scenarios. But there's also something about just the way we operate as an organisation that really matters. And increasingly, if our student populations are growing in terms of people of colour, then by default, these people should come through. And it's about what we do and how we treat them that may make them say yes or no, this is for me or this isn't for me. So part and part of the work that we're doing here and the conversations we're having will contribute to that if it's something we want to happen. But if we want it to happen, it's got to be deliberate, it's got to be purposeful, and we have to look at all of the things that may get in the way. So when we are recruiting, that name that's maybe a little harder to pronounce that you think, mm, that person who you think, well, will they be like us and part of the team? You know, those conversations just have to be challenged. And you have to challenge yourself and say, does it matter if they're like me? They can do the job. You know, let's open it up. So I think it's about that kind of honest reflection and creating a culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and again, the questions are coming in very fast. So I'm... Um, and I would like to now, it's really a hybrid of a question from Jackie and, and Helen, and it's really, I, I think, Hilary, if I can invite you to, to um, speak to this um, briefly, just so we can get in some more questions about when you have odd pockets of practice or you want to engage students in a university where there isn't much precedence of that. Um, so, you know, and, you know, Helen says, you know, when it's seen as just a few individuals, quirky, you know, um, interests. Um, so th thank you, Hilary. 
Yeah, and um, so from what I've gathered from that, how do we engage students when, you know, our institutions don't have a, a precedent in which they've engaged students successfully before and how do we do that? And I, I think that's a really brilliant question, um, especially like in relation to decor, but in, in relation to, to sort of the wider aspect of education where we where we really need to think about, you know, how are we making education a space where students feel that they are inherently included and centered in the work that we do and in how we deliver education and what we're delivering in education. Um, so great question. Um, and I always think about this in terms of what I think we've all talked about um, as, a, as a panel today, which is which is a lot about humanity. Um, and you'll, you'll hear me in everywhere I go, always love to talk about very human aspects, because I think sometimes um, as, as universities, as a sector, as institutions, um, we, we put ourselves in spaces where we, we feel like we have to do things in a set order and it has to tick boxes and maybe there's a KPI to reach and, and you do it in a certain way. Um, and sometimes it, it gets to the point where we forget the humanity of it all. Um, and I think what the actual key is when we're looking at any starting point with this is first of all, thinking about, thinking less about how can we do more and more and more to get, engage students? What can we do more of? How can we, how can we put more things out to, to engage students? And actually think about, first of all, do our students trust us? Do our students trust us to, to allow them to be partners and architects of their own education? Do our students trust us to be really authentic with what we're doing and, and have integrity that what we're doing isn't just because we now know that it has to meet an OFS regulatory requirement or has to meet some sort of you know sector requirement? Are they doing this because they actually genuinely care about the work they want us to partner with them on? And so in actually understanding that as your bottom line, it's then then you actually start to be able to build how you do student engagement in a really effective way. Um, and so once you know how whether students trust you or not, let's say they don't trust you, you, you focus the energy on building that trust and really seeing how you can incentivize students to come back to the table and actually build those relationships with you again. But if you're in a position where students already trust you, but they're just not engaging because they're, they, they're not, like, let's just keep it simple. Given scenarios, sometimes, you know, boxes this in. If students just aren't engaging, but you know that they want to, um, and I can speak, I can speak about this from the perspective of, like, I was that quirky student. If there was an opportunity, especially if I was getting re remunerated because the student finance system didn't, you know, support me fully, um, I would always jump at the chance because a, I got to help my university develop to be a better place, but b, I got paid. Um, and so I think it's important that we think about different ways that we engage students. So remuneration is always going to be, you know, one of the big things I highlight because, you know, if you're really going to recognize students as partners, you're, you have to treat them as such. So remunerate them. Um, the second thing I would say is allow them to actually be at the forefront of influencing how you are engaging them. Not every student wants to fill out a survey. Not every student wants to, you know, sit, sit on a round table. Sometimes students just want spaces that they can make their own and actually talk about the things that they want to talk about. And the task is on you to try and find ways to really make those spaces safe for students. And on top of that, extract the knowledge and the things that they are telling you they want in a really considerate way that is true to what they're talking about. So I'll cut it there because I don't want to go on for too long, but I hope that really speaks to, to the questions you asked. Thank, thanks, Hilary. And there's a lot coming through from you all about um, involving students, which is really chiming what you've said and suggested, Hilary, but also about those who can't participate and how do you get those who are reluctant and lots of good suggestions about what people are doing in their individual institutions. So thank you. Um, thank you so much. So everyone do have a look at that and we'll make the, the chat available. Um, and um, I, we have in the, la the last 10 minutes before, before we end um, an opportunity and I wish this could have been longer and we will create more, more events and, and more spaces. Um, so I, I guess that this question is quite pertinent. It's from David is how do we create safe spaces for each other to discuss the values, goals and outcomes that are important for a new reality in academia? And if I can attach to that, um, for the panelists, to suggest perhaps some more, you know, some, some, sorry, some small incremental steps about people who want to, you know, do, do, do something or, 
you know, about where, where may they start? And that's not as it sounds, it's not putting the responsibility on the panel, but it goes back to Marilyn's question, it's what does this mean for practice? Um, and how can we be good allies as well, certainly for, for, for CEDA and, and make a difference. So um, thank you. And um, in terms of the, the, the order, um, Stryker, may I, may I invite you to go first? And as I said, unfortunately, we only have um, 10 minutes. So just um, a minute each and then we'll close. Thank you, Stryker. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think the, the real secret here is to do something. <laughs> really, it's that basic. Um, you need to do something, but recognizing that I know a lot of people get caught up in the enormity of what it is we're trying to achieve and the shift that needs to happen, transformation of the institution and our curriculum. But it, it's not all on one person's shoulders. Everybody have, if you show up and you model and support even one small perspective, if you think about how across a curriculum, different individuals, different faculty or instructors can participate, and it's the collective of all those different experiences that reinforces what the institution stands for, which really sends out those graduates into the real world with a broad set of ideas rather than a singular idea from one course. And so I think when we recognize that we're, we're a part of a large collective that's moving towards a positive future for our children that it's it, our individual responsibility is to do small parts and to do them not talk about them not think about them but to get engaged um, and then we do that in collaboration with our colleagues who are also doing the same thing and it's the collective impact that really creates a, a change person or creates a, a lifelong learner for reconciliation in the future so uh, it's just about getting involved and taking that first risk. Once you take that first risk, the next one seems less and then it just sort of becomes a natural part of who you are and you become a great role model for a beautiful future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stryker. Can I um, invite Jason next, please? Hi, yeah, just to um, briefly follow what um, Stryker very quickly said. I think the most important thing is to be agile and to you know, um, equip yourself well enough to not be taking a knife to a gunfight. Um, I think the most important thing is learning and continuous learning and also all of us re-engaging or engaging continuously in, in passages of reflection, thinking about how we are complicit in these behaviours, you know, and before I, you know, turn, point the finger at anyone, one of the things that I'm always continuously doing is thinking about how as a black male, I'm unfairly privileged over black women and women of colour in the academy and society generally speaking and thinking about ways I can disrupt that privilege at any given opportunity. So even as a person of colour, I'm continuously reflecting upon my own behaviours and how my conscious and unconscious behaviours may implicitly affect uh, black women and women of colour who the majority of this work, the labour of, of race work has always fallen on them, which is what always draws me to the collective. So it is really important that we all engage in that labour co collectively and that we all engage in a process of reflexivity, which kind of draws links between, I guess, the theoretical aspects and the practice aspects, that link of praxis, which Marilyn has spoken so powerfully and inspiringly about. Thank you, Jason. Um, Marilyn, some final words from yourself? Yeah, I, again, I always feel that I'm, I benefit from listening to what everyone else has said in terms of being able to address the answer. I suppose it's made me think of two things, um, and I'll use those by way of my clothes. One is, one of our administrators in one of the departments um, said, I want to do something about allyship. And I've been reading, I was, you know, I was reading a you know, book about white privilege and I kind of feel I want to talk about it. And we said, well, go on, do it. And she put out an email to the department and said, anyone want to have like coffee and a chat and we'll just read this power, you know, read the topic together and then we'll kind of have a chat. And they have just sort of having a group now where they're regularly meeting sort of every couple of weeks during lockdown, which is really nice. And they're just saying, we don't know the language of, of action, the language of advocacy is changing and moving and we don't want to get it wrong. But if we talk about it together, we can think about how we can answer it. And they're finding a way through it. And I just think that that's really lovely. And I'm really, you know, happy, you know, just glad. And that's just sort of simple activities, people doing things. And another example, a second example was this year for Black History Month, 
we decided as a black staff group that we weren't going to just do all the work, that burden of, you know, it's Black History Month, so everyone says, what are you doing? And you think, well, hold on a minute, it's everybody's university, it's not for us. So we said, if every department did one thing, you know, we've got 10 academic departments, or we've got seven academic departments, we've had a merger, and if all the professional services and student union did one thing across a 30-day month, we could have events and we've got something now for like 20 days of the 30 whereby different people different departments everyone's own something and they're all doing something different and actually it means that it's an, a really rich experience because it's not a small group of people pulling on something that they think everybody else might do and they work all day and then they do events all night and and they're just worn out by the end of the situation still worn out <laughs> there's more people sharing that pain and I just think it's that everybody doing a little bit and feeling confident that their little bit counts. Thank you, thank you Marilyn and um, Hilary, you know, um, some words for, from you be, before we um, do our vote of thanks to the panel? Yeah, um, and I, I think I can be brief because all the panelists that came before me summed it up briefly and I, I think I can just tie it together. Um, I, I think whenever we think about doing any of this work, I, I, I always, always, always get drawn back to that human element. It's something that I'll never stop talking about. It, it's so much about humanity and, and so little about sort of the, the really unhuman things that sometimes cloud our, our, our ways of doing things and stop us from doing the things that we need to do. You know, it's, it's not about reputation. It's not about how people see you. It's not about, it's not about any of that. I think it's about really understanding that in the humanity of this journey, it's about progress and it's about growth and it's about being able to, to really do something and, 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 and feel proud of what you're doing. And so, and um, there's, there's three ways and there's just three, three things I always say anytime I leave a space like this when we have to really think about you know what it means to be practical and active in this space um, and the first thing that I would say which I said earlier is first of all be humble I, I think it's important that you know humility means be humble and not sort of centering yourself in this work but also be humble in knowing that like you're not alone in this work you are part of a collective and and so in being that part in being in that part of the collective you can have the humility to know that there are people alongside you fighting that same fight the second thing that I would say is be willing and be transparent and accountable and um, and I say those together as one thing because it's important that in this journey you allow the space for yourself to to make mistakes if you make mistakes but to learn most of all you know I've always been brought up to know that learning is the most important thing you can do and the moment that you stop learning you you you, you lose the essence of the importance of why it's always continuously important to keep learning where you can and the final thing that I would say, which really speaks to Stryker's point, actually, and then actually encapsulates what everybody has said is be bold. You don't have to worry about sort of thinking and, and, and trying to figure it all out. Just sometimes you just have to do and be bold to do it. And, and if you're convinced and you've got it in your gut that you know what you're doing and you know why you're doing it and it's for the right reasons, be bold and do it. Don't 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 be stuck in yourself or stuck in your thoughts or stuck in in whatever cloudedness comes around it just do the work and, and keep on going and 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 you'll be fine and um, so that's that's what i wanted to close on and, and hopefully that was of value and and speaks to a lot of what everybody is as has gotten from this event thank you thank you hillary um yeah i th this is yes um great great ending and what I want to um, say is a heartfelt thanks to our speakers, to Jason, to Hilary, to Stryker, to Marilyn, to all of you who have taken the time out of busy lives to come, to the um, amazing Louise Lachlan for all her backroom support and to um, CEDA, um, the, the CEDA community. And um, yeah, everyone out there trying to make a difference. Um, be bold in Hilary's words. Um, Thank you. I'm just going to play everyone out. <laughs>